Sahatamika friends, Kalayana Mita, and truth seekers who are interested in Dhamma. Yesterday, we spoke about three main topics the words Dhamma, Sasana, and Buddha. Today, we'll speak about them all gathered together as one. That is, we'll talk about Paticca Samupada, dependent origination. When we speak of, of nature or Dhamma, then Paticca Samupada is the, the law of nature. When we speak of the Sasana, Buddha Sasana or Buddhism, teaches about nature and this, of course, law of nature. And as for the Buddha, the one who sees the teacher Samupada sees the Dhamma. The one who sees the Dhamma sees me, sees the Buddha. And so this is all the same subject. We're talking about the same thing. When we, when we say, the one who sees Paticca Samupada, that one sees the Buddha, we must understand this with subtlety. One Buddha, there is the Buddha who is a thing or person that shows, that demonstrates or reveals dependent origination. That thing or person is one meaning of Buddha. And then there is the Buddha which is the law itself, the law of dependent origination itself. So there are, there are two Buddhas, or two kinds of Buddha. We can say that we will see the Buddha in everything that reveals dependent origination to us. If we notice that dependent origination is in everything, everywhere, at all times in this world, then we will be able to say, then we can say that the Buddha is everywhere, all the time, at every place in this world, ready to reveal Paticca Samupada to us. The, the Zen Buddhists speak in a rather disrespectful way that the Buddha is even in the, the dog feces. It's quite interesting that even, even in a pile of dog feces we can the, the law of dependent origination is being demonstrated all the time. So even though this is a bit crude, we can still see the Buddha in the dog feces. But as, if we speak broadly in a non, in a conciliatory way, we can say that we can see the Buddha everywhere at all times. We can see dependent origination in everything, everywhere. We can discover the Dhamma all the time in, any, in every place, in everything. The Buddha himself said once that whether in the past or the present, I teach only dukkha and the final quenching of dukkha. And this, this matter of dukkha and the remainderless quenching of dukkha is the subject of dependent origination in particular. And this is the, the religion itself, the sasana itself is right, right here. And all of this proceeds according to the law of nature. Therefore, the, the matter of the sasana 
of the Dhamma or even of the Buddha. All of it is the subject of dependent origination. So now it's time to look closely, carefully to see what, how we really, how we, how we relate or how dependent origination relates to us. we look at every atom and molecule in our bodies, we'll see that it's all nothing but dependent origination in all aspects and components of this, these bodies. So we can say that all of this body is dependent origination or that this body is full up with nothing but Paticca Samupada. We say this because this body is full of the concocting, the conditioning, the concocting of dukkha. There's both the things that are concocted and there's the, the things which are the concoctors. All this, what is called Sankara, this concocting, of dukkha is going on in this body. The aspects which are just happening naturally and aren't concerned with dukkha, we call this e tapajayata, conditionality. But the aspects which are concerned with the arising and quenching of dukkha is called paticca samupada, dependent origination. But as we said yesterday, we use these, these words often get mixed up or used in interchangeably. So we say that there is itapajayata and the pen and the teacher samupada in this life of ours constantly, all the time. The aspects which are arising and appearing and manifesting in their various ways. This we call itapajayata. But the part which is leading to the arising of dukkha, this we call paticca samupada. And so we've, we've said before that the condition of itapajayata is in every, every pore of our body, in every cell. So next we'll examine the value or meaning of the thing called Paticca Samupada. The first that we are, we are trapped in a snare. We are snared into the cycle of samsara because we don't understand dependent origination defilement, kilesa, arises. And then we, we make karma. And from making the karma, we receive the, the fruits of karma. And then there's more, def, more kilesa, more karma, and more fruits of karma. And we go spinning around in the defilements, karma, and results of karma because we don't understand dependent origination. We're trapped within this. Even if we speak like the Hindus and say that the vata, the cycle, is that of being born physically and then dying at the end of one's life and then re being reborn in another life and then dying and reborn in another life. Even if we speak like the Hindus, this spinning around from life to life is still the result of not understanding dependent origination. The second is that this mind is all tangled up. It's a disheveled mess, just like a tangled ball of thread where it's all wrapped up and knotted and just a mess. Because we don't understand dependent origination, the mind is 
all tangled up, confused. It's just a mess, just like a, a knotted up ball, entangled ball of string. The Buddha also compared the mind to a kind of grass, which in Pali is called muncha or papacha. It's some kind of grass that is so tangled up that you can't tell its beginning from its end. You can't sort out where it starts and where it ends. In Thai, it's not exactly certain what kind of plant this would be, but it's, it's probably this one kind of plant which makes, can be stripped and separated and then used for weaving very fine and delicate baskets. That's probably what it is, and it's a plant that's all kind of tangled up within itself. This is what the Buddha compared the mind to. In the past, we had a lot of this grass here at this watch, but the people took it away and made things out of it. So now we don't have any more. Next thing to look at is that because we don't know dependent origination, we don't know the eternal Buddha. Because we, because we don't understand Paticca Samupada, we, we don't know this Buddha that when he was saying, he who sees dependent origination sees the Dhamma, he who sees the Dhamma sees, sees me. This Buddha, which is the law of dependent origination, this eternal Buddha, the, the Buddha that is outside of history, the Buddha that isn't a person, the Buddha that was neither born, awakened, or entered, the Buddha that never entered Nibbana. This eternal Buddha we don't know, we don't understand, because we haven't seen dependent origination. Or we can say that because we don't know this matter of dependent origination, we don't know Buddhism. We haven't really found Buddhism because we, the Buddha sasana is all about dukkha, the arising of dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. And until we understand Paticca Samuppada, we don't really know what Buddhism is. This business of the arising and quenching of dukkha if we speak in rather simple terms, we call it the Ariya Satcha, the Four Noble Truths. But if we speak in all its implications and details, then we speak of Paticca Samuppada. The ordinary formulation of the Noble Truths, we can call the a little, the little Ariya Satcha. And then the, the explanation in terms of, the classical explanation in terms of Paticca Samuppada can be called the big Ariya Sat, or the big noble truth. So we've got the little Ariya Satcha and the big Ariya Satcha, but it's still the same thing. It's still the same matter of dukkha and the quenching of dukkha. Don't think that it's too different. Two different things. If we speak of the four points, of it in terms of four basic points, then it's called the Four Noble Truths or the Little Ariya Satcha. But if we talk about the twelve points or conditions of arising and the twelve points conditions of quenching, then we can call it, then there are 24 altogether. So if we speak in this kind of detail, we call it the Paticca Samuppada. Or if we speak even more broadly and openly, we can say that because we don't know Paticca Samuppada, we don't know the God that is omnipresent in every atom, every molecule, throughout the cosmos. This God that is everywhere, 
we haven't yet seen because we don't understand paticca samupata. So all of this is the value or meaning of paticca samupada. It's a very important, a most important thing which we all ought to to study for the sake of quenching dukkha. Only, that's the only reason for studying it. Next we'll consider the lakana or the characteristics, the character or nature of paticca samupada. There was one time when Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, said to the Buddha, as far as I feel, or in my opinion, Paticca Samupada is rather profound. He used the word rather profound. He didn't use the word extremely profound or anything like that, but it's something pretty deep. And the Buddha replied, don't say that, don't say that. But teacha samupada is the most profound thing. It's so profound, so deep, that we don't, we can't see exactly how profound it is. It's inestimably profound. Which means it's, it's very subtle, it's so detailed. And it's associated and connected to so many things that it's very difficult to understand Paticca Samupada thoroughly. But this doesn't mean it's impossible to understand. Although it's incredibly profound, detailed, subtle, and interconnected with everything, nonetheless, we can understand it For this reason, we all ought to try to understand, to penetrate Paticca Samupada. It's exactly this this thing of dependent origination in which the Buddha was awakened. The Buddha awakened to exactly this. And then he, it's about this that he thought it was too profound to teach right after the awakening when he thought that this truth was too deep for people to understand. So he thought he wouldn't, he wouldn't bother to teach it. But then a little bit later, he, it occurred to him, well, there might be two or three people who could understand it. That in this world, there ought to be some people who could understand dependent origination. And if he didn't teach about it, then these people would lose the opportunity and would get no benefit from it. So he, he decided to teach. And so all of us ought to take this to heart and, and try to understand it so that each of us, would we all, please, each of us be within this, the those few people who are able to understand dependent origination. It's up to us whether we want to understand it or not. However, Paticca Samupada is something that we won't be able to understand with total success just by listening to others, just by hearing others. It's parata gosa, the sound of others, isn't enough for us to successfully penetrate the teacher samupada. Whether reading books or discussing it with others or even listening to a talk like this, just the sound of others, the parata gosa, won't be enough for us to truly understand dependent origination. What this means is that we must study this matter for ourselves. We must investigate it for ourselves. 
even if we have to listen to somebody else explain it at first in order to get the method to, to see how to do it, then we need to investigate it ourselves. We need to do what is called yoniso, manasikara. We need to go into this subtly with, with reason. We need to investigate it within our own minds in order that panya, wisdom, and vipassana, insight, can arise. To make it a little more clear, we, we can say that we must study this, we must practice this scientifically. Don't study this philosophically. Don't, there's, to study this in a speculative way, just to think about it, make conjectures, draw inferences and things like this. This is not the proper way to study, to investigate Paticca Samupada. We must study it scientifically, which means to start with the reality of Dukkha, which all of us can observe, and then investigate that scientifically. Don't use any hypotheses. Don't use any assumptions, just use the reality itself. Deal with dukkha itself and start from there. So avoid investigating or approaching this philosophically, speculatively, like is so popular in the world. To really get to the bottom of this, we need to approach it and investigate it scientifically. However, if you wish, you're free to, you're welcome to study it philosophically. If you want to investigate and ponder upon dependent origination until you have a very subtle and lofty philosophical understanding of it, you're, you're quite welcome to do so. But it won't quench dukkha. It'll be a total waste of time. But if you want, you can, you can do it. Nonetheless, this philosophical side of dependent origination still is something that we're involved with because of our, our personal limitations. As long as we have not fully realized dependent origination, as long as we have not fully seen, been able to use it to quench dukkha, then we will still our understanding of it will still be somewhat philosophical and speculative. It won't be until we can quench all dukkha that our understanding is truly scientific. In fact, it's only the arahant who has a, a fully scientific understanding of dependent origination. For the rest of us, our understanding is more or less philosophical. If we wish, we can teach Paticca Samupada to children. If we, see, if we do this, we'll see that it's, that it's absolutely scientific. So why not give it a try? So we can <clears throat> explain to them until they observe, can see, and understand that there is the sun, and because of the sun, the water in the lakes and oceans evaporates. Because of the evaporation, it gathers clouds form. When there are enough clouds and they become sufficiently heavy, then rain falls. Because the rain falls, the place where we walk is wet. Because our path is wet, we Actually, it's not we, because the path is wet, the child slips and falls down. It's best to take a real-life experience. Because of slipping and falling, the child cracks its head open. And because of, the, of cracking its head, there is a lot of pain. The child goes to the doctor. Because of going to the doctor, the doctor does its best to, to heal the child. And then because of this, the child is healed 
and feels better. So all of this has the, the characteristics of the law of nature. So we can take ordinary experiences from the lives of children and use it to show them this, this law of nature. Or we can teach it to ordinary farmers that <clears throat> if the rain doesn't fall, or if they don't plow their fields and plant and maintain the crops properly, if due to these various conditions, then they don't get a good harvest. They don't harvest any paddy, and so they don't have enough to eat. But if the rain is good enough and they farm properly and take care of the crop, then they have a good harvest they get enough patty and they have enough to eat. So even for farmers it's possible to explain, to teach the, the fact of dependent origination. Or we can even speak to monks and novices like, our, like ourselves because we don't have any patience and endurance, because we're lacking in hiri otapa, moral shame and the fear of, of doing wrong, because our study and practice isn't sufficient, isn't proper, we start to do bad things, we start to behave improperly, and eventually we have to leave the training, we must disrobe because of these various factors. So even in some a monk disrobing, we can see the, the activity of dependent origination. Next we'll examine the formula of dependent origination to see what it's like, what it has to say. There was one time the Buddha was sitting by himself in the, in the guti, in a guti somewhere, and he, was ref he used this time to recite to himself the following. The meaning is I Due to I and form, consciousness, sense consciousness arises. The three together are patsa, contact. Due to contact, there is feeling. Due to feeling, there is craving. Due to craving, there is attachment. Due to attachment, there is bhava, becoming or existence. Due to existence, there is birth. And to to birth, there is old age, death, sorrow, etc. In this way, this is the this is the arising of all dukkha. This is something the Buddha, when he was from time to time, would recite to himself. When usually when he was alone, when he was feeling relaxed and comfortable, he would recite this formula of dependent origination. This, this version of Paticca Samupada is quite easy to understand and so it's a good starting place for us. After he had recited the dependent origination that begins with the eye, then he went on to the ear, then the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. So he recited all six groups or areas. 
turns out there was a, a bhikkhu nearby and who was, was listening without the Buddha notice, knowing. Then the Buddha noticed that this, this monk was there and he said, oh, come here, come here. Memorize this and, and then take it to investigate. The Buddha called this the Ati Brahmacharya. This is the starting point, the beginning of the, the sublime life of the Brahmacharya. So you should you should exam you should learn this and examine it carefully. There, many of us wonder how it would be or why it would be that the Buddha would sit there by himself reciting this dependent origination. Children, you know, like to make noises and things to entertain themselves, like children do. And then young people like to sing all kinds of love songs and things inspired by their, their defilements. But why would the Buddha sit here, sit there, just quietly reciting this to himself? This is something rather difficult to understand and people don't quite agree on it. I think that the reason the, this happened was because the Buddha was so familiar with dependent origination. He had been examining it so deeply and for so long that it just kind of came out. Before, before the awakening, Prince Siddhartha investigated this especially. He really went into this deeply and then was fully awakened through understanding it thoroughly. Then even after becoming the Buddha, he continued to examine this and to go into it in all kinds of detail. So it seems he was so familiar. This, the realization, the, the understanding of Paticca Samupada was so firm in his heart that it seems it just kind of came out when there was an opportunity. He was feeling relaxed and then it just kind of came out like he was singing a song to himself. For this reason, I've called, I now call this version of Paticca Samupada the humming dependent origination. And so we encourage you all to, to hum this to yourself. Instead of, you know, humming songs or singing all kinds of worthless songs like ordinary people do, it's much more useful to recite this dependent origination to oneself. You can hum it to yourself or even if you like to sing, that's okay. You can sing this to yourself. This kind of humming or singing has tremendous value, so if you wish, you you're welcome to do so. This, this humming version is, is shorter. It has basically just eight or nine stages or conditions. It begins with the inner sense space, the inner ayatana, making, coming into contact or interacting with the outer ayatana and then consciousness is, arises. These three are patsa, and then arises vetana, dhanha, and so on, all the way to, to, to dukkha. This is the short version. It's, it's more simple and easier under, to understand. The long version is basically the same, but at the, is a little, adds a few more, um, conditions or stages at the beginning. Um, there is avicca. Due to avicca, there is sankhara. Due to sankhara, due to, arises consciousness. Due to consciousness, there is nama rupa. Then due to nama rupa, there are the salayatana. So, and then from there on, it's exactly the same. 
It's just a little bit different. The long version is just a little bit different at the beginning, but it's still basically the same thing. Now we'll look at <coughs> the long version. There is the long version begins. There's the avicca datu, the element of ignorance which is all around. It's it's kind of general in the the atmosphere or something. Through this avicca datu, this when it gets an opportunity, when there's an opportunity, then ignorance or the element of not knowing then begins to concoct. It leads to the, the influence or power of sankhara, of concocting. And so because of the, when there's an opportunity, then avicadatu comes into action, it manifests. And then there's avicca, not knowing. Due to, due to not knowing, there's the mind, be, there begins to be concocting. Without ignorance, nothing would be concocted, nothing would be conditioned, and there wouldn't be any sankhara. But through ignorance, there arises this power of concocting. Concocting now has an influence. It has power over things. Then this sankhara concocts the vijnana datu, the consciousness element which is around, is then concocted through this ignorant concocting. It's concocted into sense consciousness, the consciousness that clearly knows the various objects of experience, of the very sensual objects. And so there is avicca. Due to avicca, there is the power of concocting. Due to, then due to the power of concocting, there arises the consciousness element is concocted into sense consciousness, which means, and then the mind is there. Once there's the mind, there can be the thing we call nama rupa. Without consciousness, without mind, it's, it's pointless to speak of a body. But once there is vijnana, once there is, which stands for the consciousness and then all the mental things that arise from it, then, then one can have nama rupa, the body-mind complex. Then once there is nama rupa, one can. There are the the salayatana, the sense, the sense organs and sense objects. And then there's contact, feeling, dana, upadana, and so on, as we've already heard. So the end part is is the same as the short, concise humming version, but at the beginning these other elements. And this is where it's difficult to understand. The later part is quite straightforward, clear, and easy to observe in life. But the, the first part is much more difficult. That avicca, not knowing, this not knowing things as they really are, um, becomes leads to this power or influence of concocting. Concocting has influence, and so the vijnana datu is cooked up, is concocted into sense consciousness, and then there arises nama rupa. This is the part where it's, it's difficult to understand. The later half is, is pretty straightforward. Earlier, when we, when we mentioned how the Buddha said that this was, that dependent origination was very profound, this is because of the first few conditions or links. This is where it's so difficult to understand. The latter part is, the latter part is probably what Ananda was talking about. But when we ask, 
how does avicca lead to sankhara? And how does this power of concocting lead to vijnana? And how does, from vijnana, how does there arise nama rupa? This, these three or four conditions at the beginning, this is the part that's so very subtle and difficult to understand. However, whether we talk about the long version or the the shorter, simpler version, it's still basically the same matter. So if you wish, it's enough just to study the the shorter one. This is sufficient for for quenching dukkha. You can you can take the one that begins with the I interacts with form with rupa and then consciousness arises and there is contact but this is this is avicca patsa avicca sampat this is contact with not knowing just like in the big version it begins with ignorance with not knowing even in the short version when there is contact we shouldn't forget that it's contact with with ignorance. And then because of this ignorance, there arises vetana, ignorant vetana, craving, attachment, and dukkha, all the way to dukkha. So we can study this, this shorter, simpler version, and it will accomplish everything we need. <clears throat> and then we see that it's necessary to have sati, to be mindful at that moment when the eye interacts with form or the ear interacts with, with sound, so that avicca isn't allowed to come in and make it ignorant contact. And then there's, there's wise contact, and it doesn't concoct up into, into dukkha. So the long version is, is quite difficult to understand at the beginning, but the end part is the same. And either way, it's the same. We're still talking about the same fact or the same law. So it's, it's enough for us to understand beginning when, when the I and the form interact and there is consciousness so that we know how to be mindful and wise at the moment of, conscious, of, of eye contact, ear contact, and so on. There's... Another secret of dependent origination that we need to know. Because if we don't practice correctly, if we don't practice correctly being mindful of dependent origination, then dukkha arises. When we're mindful and practice in the right way, then dukkha can't arise. But what do we, what do, we do when we didn't when we made a mistake, when we didn't practice right, and dukkha arises, what should we do then? The Buddha further explained that when there is dukkha, when there is dukkha, there will arise sata. Sata means the faith or confidence that there must be something that will end dukkha. Satam, from the experience of dukkha, then there arises confidence that there must be a way out of dukkha. To me, it seems that this is just an, an order, this is just a natural instinct. When an animal is suffering, it will, it will run somewhere to something that it thinks will remove the suffering such as a dog with mange or with some, with a sore, it will run to a person or a place that it thinks can get rid of the suffering. Or a cat, when it's in pain, will run, will run, run to someone, its, its mother or a per, its owner, to get help. So it's very natural and instinctual to seek the end of suffering when when there is pain and suffering. So due to dukkha, there arises sada. This is something 
absolutely necessary for us to have, to have this sada, that there is a way out of dukkha, that we can find something that will get rid of dukkha. When we're sick, we have the belief that there must be a doctor who can help us. When we're sick, we believe that there's a doctor somewhere that can help us. There's a hospital we can go to. There's medicine which can, when, can, which can cure us. So our illness, our, suffer, our physical suffering, causes us to have this kind of faith. Or a child, when it's hurt, it runs to its mother out of the faith that mommy will help in some way. This is totally natural. And therefore, when, when there is dukkha, we need to run to dhamma, to run to find some dhamma, to discover dhamma, the thing that will eliminate, which will quench dukkha completely. When we have this kind of sada, when there is this correct sada, then one looks for a satabhuru. Satabhuru means a good person, but in, in Buddhism it means especially the, the Buddha or one of his disciples, especially the Arahant. So when there is true sada, one looks for a good person, someone who understands the Dhamma and can explain the Dhamma. And then one sits, one approaches the Satabhuru, or the Impali Sapurisa. One approaches the Sapurisa and sits near the Sapurisa and then listens to the Dhamma. This is what arises out of proper confidence and faith. Then there arises a satisfaction in the Dhamma that one has heard. This is called Piti, Piti satisfaction or contentment. <laughs> then the mind is calmed, the f mind's fear is calmed. This is called patsati or tranquility. When those things calm down, there arises a joy, a, a, a mental kind of sukha, one, a certain kind of mental sukha we call joy. This particular kind of sukha causes samadhi. And due to this samadhi, due to this right concentration, there is a realization of seeing things as they really are. One realizes the way things actually truly are in this, in this world. Seeing things as they, real, they really are leads to disenchantment with the objects of our attachment. All this, there's no, leads to disenchantment or nipita. Then due to this nipita, this disenchantment with the things we used to attach to, there arises viraka, which is the fading away, the dissolving and disappearing of attachment. As it as attachment fades away and dissolves, eventually it's finished. And when attachment is finished, this is called vimuti, liberation or emancipation. Then when one is free, is liberated from attachment, there arises a particular kind of knowledge, the knowledge which, which is called kaya jnana, the knowledge of ending that all dukkha has ended. And then this knowledge of ending, this kayayana, causes one to have what we call nibbana. Then nibbana appears, nibbana manifests, and our, our business is over. And so one ought to observe that even after dukkha, there are the condi conditions of dependent origination. After dukkha, there can still arise another set or another flow of dependent origination of 
ปาทาพีทีปาสตีสุขะ and so on However, the Buddha didn't call this second one p a t i c h a s a m u p a d a He called it upanisa dhamma, which means that which relies upon or depends upon p a t i c h a s a m u p a d a So the second from sata onwards is that which is dependent upon or relies upon dependent origination. Upanisa dhamma. Something that's rather strange and quite interesting is that sata, whether you translate it faith, trust, confidence, sata comes from dukkha. The more dukkha there is, the more faith. The more dukkha, the more trust or confidence that there is a way out of dukkha. The more, the more firm and vigorous dukkha is. Then the more firm and vigorous one's one's faith is, and then from that faith it leads onward to p t and so forth. So having this this kind of faith, or seeing dukkha, being aware of dukkha, experiencing dukkha, and then wanting to get free of dukkha. This is something absolutely necessary if there's going to be correct faith. So please examine this and this point, this fact, so that we have this correct kind of faith. Please don't don't waste your time on other kinds of of faith or sata. Please make sure your your trust, your confidence. Is the kind that comes from dukkha, and the the true desire to be free of dukkha. Now, in order to get along with other religions, in order to kind of reconcile with other religions, we need to we need to understand this point carefully. For example, often people talk about faith in God. And this, we need to understand if this faith in God exists without any understanding or experience of dukkha, then that faith is foolish. It's just a blind kind of faith. But if the faith in God is coming from the experience of dukkha, from a deep, deepening understanding of dukkha, and then there arises a faith that God is the way to get out of dukkha. This. This is something we can find much more acceptable. So there are, we can kind of say, two kinds of sata. There's the the foolish, blind, credulous kind of faith that comes when people have not really experienced dukkha, and then there's the the valid kind of practical confidence. That comes from the experience of dukkha. So we should be careful with the words faith and and confidence. They actually seem to have different meanings. One tends to be blind and foolish, where confidence is a more proper translation of sada. The sada that comes <coughs> before wisdom isn't worth very much. You can't do. With this kind of blind faith that comes before with, there is wisdom, you can't. It's not going to help us very much. But the the faith or the sata, the confidence that comes from wisdom, this is this is quite valuable. When there is panya, wisdom, and understanding of p a t i c h a samupada, then the faith. The sata, the confidence that comes from that, is something very valuable. So this is this is the kind of sata we want, not the blind kind, but the sata that comes from wisdom, from seeing dependent origination for ourselves. At this time, it would be best to talk about the benefits <coughs> of. Paticca samupada. 
First of all, the understanding of Paticca Samupada will cause us to realize that there is no self. We'll see that there's nothing that can be taken as a self or as of self of being me or mine. Seeing Paticca Samupada, we see that there's just this flow of dependent origination going on endlessly. And in that, there's nothing that can be considered a self that can be taken as I or mine. So this is the first benefit that dependent origination will free us of of self and belonging to self or things of self. The belief that there is a self or a soul is a belief of other religions. This is not a Buddhist belief. It's not proper to Buddhism to believe so. But it's a belief that existed before Buddhism and continues to exist in many, many religions even today. And also it has insinuated itself into Buddhism. This belief in a self or a soul, you can see it in many Buddhists. The majority of Buddhists actually believe they have some kind of self or soul. And so we can use through our study and understanding of Paticca Samupada, we can, we can get free of this belief that there is a self or soul somewhere. The next benefit is that Paticca Samupada will cause us to see that there's no, there's no one who does things. Ordinarily, we think that there's always one who does it. There's the one who. Or like in English, we have, there's an act and an actor. The teacher Samupada will enable us to cut off the er. There's just the act. There's eating without an eater. There's no er in things. There's no, there's making, but not the maker. So there's no er or one who who does things. There's just things are done. There's there's eating but there's no eater. There's living without the one who lives or the liver. There's no one who dies. There's no one who is born. Seeing dependent origination, seeing Paticca Samupada enables us to see that there's no one who. It frees us from the one who does this, who does that, who is this or is that. The next benefit or advantage is that Paticca Samupada enables us to stay in the middle, to be in the middle, or to be on the middle path. Paticca Samupada enables us to avoid all extremes, such as the extreme of there is and the extreme of there is not. To say that things are, that they exist, is to overlook that the fact that they're constantly changing and flowing. To say that they don't exist is also to ignore the fact that there's this, this constant flow. One can say there is, one cannot say there is not. But teaches Samupada allows us to be in the middle where the way things actually are. Paticca Samupada allows us to be in the middle, free of both good and evil. It allows us to be free of this and that. This is just a flow of dependent origination. That is just a flow of dependent origination. There's not really any this or that. There's just this flow of dependent origination. It frees us from self and other. So seeing dependent origination will free us from all these this is and that, all these these dualisms. By seeing that anything that you take to be some pair of opposites is just a flow of dependent origination. The next benefits are that 
dependent origination will help us to see very profound dhammas. We'll mention them one by one. The first is the teacher Samupada helps us to see anichang, to see that everything is constantly flowing, that it's all just constant flow of change. Or as the Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, pantare, all flows, everything flows in a flux. And it helps us to, to see, to realize sankata or sankatang, the, the fact that everything is concocted, all things are conditioned, comba- compounded, concocted. They don't, that's just the way things exist, with the exception only of nibbana. All things are, all things that we experience in this world are concocted. This is called sankata, or the, the reality of sankata, concoctedness. Seeing dependent origination helps us to see vaya dhammang, vaya dhammang, which is that all things are deteriorating, all things are decaying. Once something arises, it, it will never remain the same. As soon as it arises, it begins to decay, to deteriorate. To, to disappear. Then it will help us to see the, the breaking up, the relaxing, the releasing of attachments, which is called virakang, the fading away, the fading away of our attachments. When we see dependent origination, we begin to let go of the things we are attached to, and then we can start to realize this, this dissolving and breaking up of attachment. And then we see that all things have arising and quenching, arising and quenching as their their ordinary nature. Things are ordinarily just arising and ceasing, arising and quenching. This this is enough for now. In fact, there are all kinds of other benefits of seeing dependent origination, but to list them all is would take too long and we don't have the the time or the strength. So, but just these few, seeing to realize anijang, sankatang, vayatamang, virakang, like this, this is enough for us to successfully quench dukkha. The next benefit is that due to seeing Paticca Samupada, no, no kind of nichaditi, no kind of wrong view or wrong understanding will occur. There won't be any wrong understanding. All the, the 62 kinds of nichaditi which are listed in the Pramajala Sutta, none of these can appear when we, when we realize, when we are seeing the reality of Paticca Samupada. Or even the samaditi of of, of worldlings. Even this worldly samaditi cannot arise when we're seeing dependent origination. You should be aware that there are two levels or kinds of samaditi. There is the samaditi, the right view, that is still connected with the asava, the samaditi of people, of worldly samaditi. And then there's the samaditi of the arahant, the transcendent right, right view. When we are seeing dependent origination, there's no way that the, this worldly samaditi, the samaditi still connected with the asava, the eruptions, this, this cannot arise when we are experiencing seeing. Paticca Samupada. The next benefit is kind of amusing or funny. If, because seeing dependent origination causes there to be Dhamma preachers or Tamagatip, people who can, can teach or preach the Dhamma. If someone is talking about Dhamma or preaching about Dhamma but doesn't see dependent origination, then their explanations and teaching will be incorrect. 
but while speaking, if one is aware, if one experiences paticca samupada, then that that preaching of Dhamma will be correct and true. So the true Dhamma speaker or preacher arises when we see, when we realize dependent origination. The next benefit is that we'll know who we'll know who this body and mind belongs to. When we see Paticca Samupada, we realize that it doesn't belong to anybody. This this body and mind doesn't have an owner. It isn't the owner of anything. We see that there's when this body and mind is constantly flowing as dependent origination, we see that there's nothing that can own it and that it itself can't own anything. So we realize that there's there's no owner. There's no ego that belongs to it or that's in it or that can that can control this life. So we see that this life has no owner. This life doesn't own anything. It's totally free of of ego and and my go. The last and most funny benefit is that seeing when we see Bhatitya Samupada, this life cannot bite its owner. When we're when we're ignorant of dependent origination, when we're unaware of it, then this life turns and bites its owner. When we when we are unable to see that life itself, the experience of life, all the things that life comes into contact with, when we don't see that it's all just dependent origination, then there arises attachment to life, attachment to the experiences and the objects, and then life bites its owner. But seeing that it's all just dependent origination, there's there's no owner to be bit. And then and life has no need to bite anything. And so life doesn't bite its owner. So be very interested in this benefit. It's, it's the best of all, that we can live without life biting its owner if we see dependent origination. The Buddha said that seeing, realizing the teacher Samupada is Sota Bhati Yanka, Sota Bhati Yanka, which means the factor that is ready to be Sotapana, or the necessary factor for being prepared to be Sotapana. Sotapana means being at the standing at the threshold of Nibbana. Sotapana means one standing right at the door or threshold of Nibbana. It's only a matter when one will step in and, and enter. And Bhatitya Samupada is the, the factor that makes us ready to be Sotapana. So it's the factor of readiness for Sotapana ship or hood or whatever. The teacher Samupada is, has all of nature as its subject matter. And all laws of nature, the whole, all of the law of nature is just this dependent origination. I think if we talked about it for a week that we couldn't exhaust the subject. I think we could speak even for a month and still not finish talking about dependent origination. But what we need to know at the beginning to start is what we've been discussing so far. I think that what we've discussed so far is enough for us to take and reflect upon, to investigate, to examine in and for ourselves. So I encourage all of you to to do so, to take this. We don't need to go into all the details. What we've discussed now is enough for you to investigate and examine in order to quench dukkha. Thank you for being good listeners. 
and by now the dependent origination of aches and pains are beginning to arise and maybe even the Paticca Samupada of dissatisfaction and impatience and aversion will be occurring so we better stop now thank you that ends today's talk Thank you.